Hello, family. It's Kalata. Welcome to Your Work Auntie podcast. And I'm excited to share some news with you all. One, I've been in a little unplanned break. And there is an episode coming really soon about how to get out of a funk (laughs) when you're a little bit stuck. But I'm excited to be back. I'm excited for it to be almost six months exactly since we launched the podcast. And so I'm celebrating by offering new resources, products, and services. I'm excited to share that on the 1st of April, I launched the Your Work Auntie merchandise store. And it is my work, sorry, your work auntie.myspreadshop.com. And I encourage you all to check it out. There's so many different styles. I tried to, one, cater to the fact that your work auntie is every woman and all of us, right? But then I also wanted to allow different styles for people that like simpler, are into anime or other styles. And eventually more styles will be added to the store as I find different artists and vendors that I would like to use in order to create my designs. So appreciate you all so much for supporting the podcast. Appreciate all of those who are coming back after the break and those who listened so far. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Now to the episode. Hello, family. Welcome to Your Work Auntie Podcast. I'm your host, Kalata Marie Holmes. Thank you all for joining us for another episode. I'm excited because today I have a great guest, uh, uh, Miss Honor Ramirez is joining us. Um, and we're going to have a really great conversation about belonging, diversity, career, um, and whatever comes up for us. But before we dive in, I would like to have Anna introduce herself and tell the listeners more about Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Super excited. Um, So like you said, I'm Ana Ramirez and I currently live in Pennsylvania. Um, I've moved around a ton, but originally I am from uh, Colombia, South America, and came to the U.S. when I was about two years old. So I've lived primarily in Chicago, but have moved around a bunch And um, yeah, thankfully, I've been able to go back and forth and keep my culture very present in my life and also having the benefits of living in this amazing country as well. So um, I am a dog mom (laughs) and I'm recently new to Pennsylvania. I moved here from Miami and um Yeah, it's been really great. And I work in um, diversity, inclusion, and belonging for a company that this month, actually, I'll be completing 10 years working with them. Wow, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. It's crazy that it's gone so fast. Um, I've grown up there. But I, um, yeah, I've been there 10 years as a software company, and I work remotely. due to the pandemic and thankfully I get to keep that (laughs) and still work from home so yeah and I'm also a dog mom so yeah yes I'm a dog mom as well my dog is Pearl (laughs) she's a Pearl I'd say that's my only child (laughs) yeah yeah. very spoiled and well loved (laughs) yeah that's no, lovely. I'm excited to get into this conversation. I think, well, the first thing I want to start with is how did you end up in the DEI space? Like, what was that journey like for you? Did you always know you wanted to work there or was it something that you <laughs> realized was a need? Yeah. Um, so my degree is actually in visual journalism. It's in photography. So it is quite a different <laughs> journey than what I sought out to do. Um, back in the day so it has curved and turned and just pivoted in in many different directions but um, I got into HR and into DEI because I um, I know I mentioned it previously but I had some friends at work that were incredibly unhappy and generally in my job in my role um I'm, I'm in tune to a lot of those things of whether you're, you know, happy or not at the company. And 
I I just, you know, my friends happen to be Hispanic and um, Black African American, and they got put on performance plans. And I just couldn't understand how some of my friends and colleagues could be so unhappy and have such a different experience than me. At that moment, I realized there was a gap. And I just naturally started to be the one to kind of start knocking on the door saying, hey, I think there's something going on here. This would be, you know, worthy of looking into emailing executives and saying, like, it's kind of odd that all three of my friends from, you know, uh, IT are minorities and on performance plans. And that just kind of really stood out to me. And um, I will say for a lot of my life, I do have a ton of privilege Um, I'm white passing. I am Hispanic, Latina, but I was always told I speak like a white girl and I'm, you know, I have this certain way about myself. So I'm very aware of the privileges I had. So I had personally never experienced um, that level of discrimination, um, especially when it came to your job. Um, I experienced it in other ways, right? But um, probably more so for being a woman than Hispanic. Um, But it was just, it really stood out to me. And it just something that started to naturally happen. I had no idea this was even a career opportunity. Um, I didn't know it existed um, until we had our first full-time employee get hired in inclusion and diversity. And it was just kind of like a light bulb of like, oh, I can be myself somewhere and like being useful at the same time because I naturally um, care very deeply. I'm a pretty big empath empath, and I just started to realize I can use a lot of what I naturally have and actually like get paid to make progress and you know an impact at work and it just seemed like the right fit and I started to win awards for it. I started to get recognized for it and so there's lots of signs telling me that like this was the way to go. So I've been in the role specifically for three years now since I made that transition into HR. Wow. I mean, and kudos to you for like what you said, seeing something and then standing for it and letting people know that there is something to do about it. Because many people would have been like, well, that sucks for you all, <laughs> you know, like figure yes. it out or we'll have to leave. But, you know, I think really having the courage um, and then, like you said, recognizing what privilege you had to say, like, I can speak up about this and help advocate for others. So really, wanna- yeah. Shout out to you for that. And then encourage <laughs> listeners who are listening. You could be the change you want to see. You could be like Anna. <laughs> oh <my gosh. laughs> well, it's really interesting because I wasn't really known to be an outspoken person. I could be a, a come off as shy and timid. Um, but I, I guess I really realized that like one thing I can't stand for is injustice and unfairness. Like I just didn't. I was like, no, not where I can have some type of influence, right? Like, I'm, it kind of felt like I'm I'm going to mom and dad and we're going to talk about what's going on here to fix it, right? Yeah. And um, it's been very eye-opening because not everything just gets fixed with putting a complaint in and making people aware. These things are very deep-rooted in structure and the system, the way it's set up. So um, that's when I realized how how high the mountain really is so yeah Yeah, and I think that is it it does take time to make changes in organizations and sometimes some of us don't even get to see the result like we'll do all of the the core carrying and we'll plant the seeds and then we move on and then somebody else at least benefits but for me it's all about you know leaving a place better than you and then it was when you arrived so I, I think of it that way so I think one question that a lot of people listening may have, and so for clarification is, what is the difference between diversity, inclusion, and belonging? Uh, So inclusion (laughs) um, is 
you know, being asked to dance at the party, right? They talk about like getting invited and being asked to dance. Mm -hmm. um, and those are really important things, of course. Like, you know, diversity is our makeup and it is definitely um, making sure that we're evening the playing field of people who are applying for work or, you know, and just making sure we have representation, um, you know, and people that look like the people in your communities. Mm -hmm. um, so inclusion is like the process, the skill sets that are necessary to um, make people feel like they do belong. So, um, and then belonging is not just getting invited to the party, but feeling safe enough to know you want to come back to the party because you could be yourself and you didn't have to adapt to the environment. You could just be your unique self and, you know, be authentic and not be worrying about the judgments or, you know, what it will mean if you say this or if you're that way. It really is providing that space for you to be yourself, which um, is completely backwards, I think, from society. We're taught how to adapt and how to code switch and how to adjust to like others and the environments we're in where I work we really try to make it to where we want your best self because we know at the end of the day that's going to bring the highest quality output of work right so um, it's a win-win for organizations and for the individual and of course society humanity all of those great things so yeah no, thank you for explaining that and breaking it down. I think some people, I think like you said, there's so many terms and people do mix them up and they're like, oh, well, this is all the same. And it's it's all just, and you know, there's certain groups that are like, oh, it's all just being woke. No, it's about appreciating people for who they are and letting them, you know, feel like they, they should be there and they can be there safely. And I think that was the key point about being safe, right? Because a lot of us are invited into environments and they even sometimes create roles, right? For diversity yeah. and all the stuff. And then you get there and you're like, wait, but the microaggressions are wait, like, yeah. why are you asking me, like telling me to smile all the time and policing my face yeah. and, you yeah. know, it's all, it's all these things that happen. It's like, you know, they, they invite us to the party, but the party definitely doesn't feel safe. We're all like crushing right. her. We're all like holding our bags real close and staying by the yeah. wall. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, it's one of those things that I feel really connects us on a level that it doesn't matter about ethnicity or identity. We all know what it feels like not to belong somewhere, okay. right? And how impactful it is. Uh, to everything, the whole experience and the way we show up. So, um, but of course, underrepresented, you know, communities feel it way more um, on a way deeper level. And that's the generational level um, mm -hmm. where you, you just don't bring your best foot forward when you don't belong. So, yeah, we're working really hard. And if you say your initiative is diversity, that's the easy part, right? Mm -hmm. Like recruiting and hiring. But if you don't put inclusion first, you're kind of just in this revolving door syndrome that many organizations experience because uh, the key to the formula is belonging because you won't be able to retain your really, you know, good key talent from underrepresented communities if you're not thinking about inclusion and belonging. Yeah. So that leads me to my next question. What is some advice you would give an organization that hasn't really, they figured out diversity, right? Because recruiting is the yeah. easy part, like you target yeah. certain schools and, you know, you make sure your applications are, your, your it's open and you're or advertising. But then the inclusion and the belonging is where I feel like a lot of companies suffer. So what is some advice you'd give to business owners or even people in the field who, are trying to like create that in their organizations yeah i think number one is understanding your people and i think it's the hardest part because you have to listen to really hard truths sometimes and you have to look uh not just the organization has to look in the mirror and the culture but yourself right like this is a really deep journey for individuals um, and it has to happen in order for real change to happen. So um, I think it's just starting to have those really com those conversations with your employees 
um, especially from, you know, your black, your Hispanic and your women, your Asian employees, like everyone that is non-white, <laughs> you should be right. having a conversation with to start understanding what their experience is. Do they feel they, they can bring their best self to work? Do you feel that there are areas of improvement? What are they? Right. And just mm-hmm. You could start with just a conversation and an analysis of what is the the health and the well-being of the culture at an organization. Um, it's it's not easy, but it's simple, in my opinion, right? It's just connecting and having those conversations, which I think is really backwards. You know, I mean, we're human beings. We're not robots. Right. Um, so we have very different needs and very different experiences. Not one solution fits all. Like that, that in the understanding the expectations of the work is important because um, this is not a space for instant gratification. Like you said, this is a journey. You plant the seed and you may not watch it bloom, um, but you knew that you were, you know, part of the process and and part of the journey. So. Um, yeah, just start having those conversations, host focus groups, you know, understand the climate of, you know, what your employees are saying about where you work. I think that's like step one is really understanding what your issues are, where your gaps are. Um, just kind of how I started this career in general um, is really understanding that there's a divide and a gap and there's a uh, solutioning to happen here you know at least to start at because there's there's never just this is not check box right it's never just one thing <laughs> and it, like you yeah. said it depends on your population your people and the type of work right because some environments are just different and they're more demanding and sometimes yeah. there's some environments also that are just naturally a little more I don't want to use the word hostile but like I've worked in teams where the work was so intense like we, it was a very like gladiator survival. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. and it was just that was the culture, and like not everybody is ready for that. And so, you know, helping people either, either we need to figure out how to shift the culture for so it's more welcoming or figure out how yeah. to get people prepared for, yeah, you're about to go into the arena. <laughs> like it, it's real, real tough work. And I feel like sometimes people just get thrown in and it's like, oh, you're figured out. And, We'll give you yeah. a bunny or a mentor, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, good luck. Um, yeah, definitely. It's also understanding like what what's right for you as an individual as an employee. I think, especially since the pandemic, the employee really gained um, a huge benefit in being able to um, find jobs much easier, you know, because that the shift, everything shifted, everything changed. Um you know, limitations were lifted. Everyone was working from home. So you can apply for jobs across the country that you could never apply for previously. So it really even the playing field, like I don't think the world was really truly ready for. But um, yeah, I think if that's it's knowing yourself as well, if those are hostile environments, they could still be healthy, you know, Mm -hmm. um, and understanding the difference and how it feels for you. Um, Because, yeah, time is usually deadlines and things have to get accomplished. But if you don't feel supported or respected by your leader or your teammates, um, who cares about the deadline or, you know, the hostile environment? It's just like it impairs so much. No, that's fair point. I don't think that um, companies do try to apply a one size fits all approach. Like we go to these conferences and we hear somebody say, well, this works for my organization. Oh, so let's bring this program over here. And I'm a big fan of, of borrowing what other people have done, right? Especially in yeah. HR and DEI, there's not a lot of new things to do, right? right? But you have to make it new for your organization and then like make sure that it can be applied and it works for your culture your mission, the pace of work you need, and the kind of employees you have. Because even, you know, it's different if you have a a multinational organization, then you're dealing with not only our own U.S. cultural challenges and concerns, you're also adding in those other dynamics. And so, like, really taking the time to invest in it, because a lot of times companies invest in the study, but they don't invest in the implementation. And so I I also think that's where a big gap is that I've seen um, as a consultant and in some of my other HR roles. 
Yeah, it's tough, especially, I mean, my company is a global one and that just adds on a whole other layer um, and really cultural competency really comes, you know, into play there. And um, we're not expected to like just know everything, you know, Mm -hmm. but we have to study and understand our people. You know, it comes down to, to equity and really knowing what the culture and what the individuals really need to thrive. So... Yeah. And so in your experience, what resources have you offered to managers? Because I often find times, sometimes, especially managers that have been in the game a long time, they often yeah. don't know how to really like, um, you know, demonstrate some of the things we're talking about around like being yeah. more inclusive. Because sometimes they believe they're doing it, but there's like small gaps in, in, yeah. sometimes in their experience or knowledge. Yeah, um, so a couple different approaches. One, um, we do have a training for inclusive leaders, um, which is just part of manager onboarding for them to be aware um, of, you know, different identities, the way, you know, it could maybe process differently for people and just creating that awareness um, and things like microaggressions. I mean, some people have just never even heard of some of these terms um, or even thought of how someone could experience something like that. So um, awareness is key for sure. And, um, you know, it's it's just really, like I said, knowing your people mm-hmm. and knowing what they need and, and taking the risk to ask how are you doing? You know, are you happy here? Like, what are the things that drive you? What are your career goals? Um, Do you feel supported? If not, how can I support you, right? I think it takes a certain level of vulnerability that um, it's not always easy to do. Um, And being, you know, having cultural competency to know that certain cultures are not as inclined to, you know, quote unquote, own your career and ask for that promotion or ask for that training um, and meeting them where they are and really uh, having that understanding of every single employee, your reports basically under you. Yeah. I went to a multinational school in Chicago. So I went to Illinois Institute of Technology. Shout out Hawks or whatever we call it. I was not. <laughs> we're, we're into the athletic. But I, it was so, we were, I would consider us an international school. We had way more students that were not American or were like first generation um, than I think a lot of schools in the area. But it was interesting, like interviewing for roles and jobs. That's where I really first started to see the difference, even in how certain interview questions were answered. You yeah. know, it's like, you know, because then like we like to ask, like, what's your greatest weakness? There are some cultures where they'll never answer that question. They're like, right. I don't have one. Right. Yeah. They just will never answer it. But we, you know, you know, we're like, oh, you can't admit that you have a weakness. But culturally for them like no why would you admit that why are we talking about my weaknesses let's talk about what i can do well for your organization and i'm sure over time they got trained to answer the question right but it's also like you know thinking about how can we ask even starting with the interview how can we be more inclusive and thoughtful in the questions we're asking so that people feel comfortable um recently i i was speaking with one of my colleagues And there was an interview question where the manager told people to rate themselves one to 10. And Mm -hmm. I said, as a person, if I got an interview question where I was told to rate myself, I would completely freak out because I don't know how that can go. Because if I rate myself low, will you then judge me to say like, I don't have enough confidence, I'm not good at the job. And if I rate myself high, will you believe me? And I was like, so I was like, that's one of those things where I was like, I, that's just too much emotional anxiety for you to find out if I'm good at something. Right. Good ways to get to yeah. that instead of forcing me to rate myself. And so, yeah. you know, I think it even starts there. Like before you even onboard people, how can we create, you know, welcoming and inclusive interview environments and and really think more about the questions. Um, a couple episodes ago, we talked about recruiting quite a bit, and mm-hmm. we were really I- talking about how managers need training and how to interview yeah. because that is really your first experience with the organization yeah. and sometimes we get that little like you know the or the hairs raised in your arm you're like something didn't feel right but we'll still take the job right yeah. and then we yeah. come in and we're like oh that's the thing that i kind of felt in the interview yeah. i'm seeing i'm experiencing it now 
Yeah, it's um, it's super important. I mean, it is that first step, and uh, I think people can, you know, sense a lot through that first point of contact um, and that impression. So uh, I think it goes back to authenticity. Um, you know, and if someone else is showing up that authentically real, it really does provide that space for, you know, you to do that as well. And yes. it starts to feel like the norm here, right? Instead of playing a part. Mm-hmm. So related to that, that authenticity is professionalism. The, 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 the idea of it, a lot of it is classist and a little bit racist, right? Mm-hmm. In some ways. And so yeah. it's like, you don't say like, oh, that person was a professional in the interview. And I'm like, what do you mean by that? You know, was it that they were, you know, like I talk with my hands or was it that they had an act? Like what was not professional? Was it how they dress? Like, let's really talk about how you decided this person wasn't professional in the interview. And I've been in interviews where I was like, okay, this wasn't professional. But generally it was based on how they answered questions or something. But sometimes I think we look at, um, you know, and even for me, I was in an interview once with the candidate. She was great, very authentically herself. Like you can tell, she got up that morning and was like, "I'm yeah. bringing me, I'm awesome." And I think my first reaction to that was like, "Wow, like she's really like." Yeah. yeah. And then I had to say like that, and I had to remind myself like, that's a good thing. That's a yeah. good thing that she was so comfortable that she showed up not overly buttoned up and stiff. Like you can tell, like this was her. Like, if I saw her on the street, I would still get the same exact person, you know, that I'm interviewing. And so I think people also have to really challenge our internal, our bias sometimes of still reacting to, oh, that person's acting like themselves. Like, they're not like corporate Aaron or, you know, something like that. Like, they're being themselves. Well, and that's what stands out these days because the norm is to not be, you know, and to, I mean, we're constantly like trying to process so much information all the time especially in new environments we're like how do I best fit in here Mm -hmm. Um, and that's the thing you know that's the important piece like it's not about fitting in it shouldn't be so you have to be okay with accepting multiple truths because it's not about right or wrong here it's just about what is and accepting that It doesn't have to be anything you are have ever seen before or been exposed Mm -hmm. to or have experience in but um it's okay to be yourself and that is just like a really big shift and backwards from what i think we were taught i think especially um you know underrepresented communities and also you know immigrants i mean i immigrated Mm -hmm. to this country and it was like You know, I used to be okay being called Anna because that was more American, right? Right. And it took a really long time for me to be like, actually, my name is Anna because I'm Hispanic, you know, and embracing that. But I think we immediately just instinctively, it's survival, right? To like make sure we fit in and don't get bullied. And, you know, it all Mm -hmm. starts on the ground at school (laughs) or even before school right but um we're just taught that there's social norms cultural norms this is how you behave or else um you're judged or defined as x right and um it really takes a, an opening, a shift of opening our minds that um, there could be multiple truths for people, multiple realities for people. Like it's not just one. Um, and that that's a really hard thing to shift that mindset to shift. It that. is. And then being in some place that's safe to do it, right? Because a lot of us, there are some environments where we still don't feel safe. It's like, well, <laughs> you know, we talk about that a lot of like, you know, you could bring your best authentic self is what we've we've been talking about a lot in like a lot of the black professional circles it's like yeah we can't really be fully authentic because that's not quite accepted yet but i can be my best authentic self like just a little below my church self you know (laughs) it's like you know whatever that is and so it's like really getting people to accept the fact that you know in work Yes, when you're dealing with customers, there's certain protocol and things, but on your day to day, you should be able to just, you know, be who you are, you know, and have conversations in a way that makes you feel comfortable. That I related so much to what you said about your name, because, you know, my name means Kalata. Most of the time, my name is actually very easy. It's three syllables, right? But people make it very complicated. 
and they would want to shorten it all the time and call me like K or La or Tila. <laughs> yeah. And when I was younger, I would kind of accept that. And then I got older and I was like, absolutely not. My name's Kalata. Yeah. And you will say all yeah. three syllables. It's not yeah. very hard. They're very much like <laughs> full school. Like, like they're like elementary, like you're like most toddlers should be able to say my yeah. name pretty efficiently. <laughs> so, you know, but it's like that whole idea of like, oh, well, my name's hard. I'm like, I don't have a hard yeah. name. You yeah. know, especially like yeah. once I really started meeting people from other countries in college and and really experiencing some hard names that were like, oh, like my favorite name and I hope he listens or someone. His name was Prigimic. It There was no vowels in that name. Not a single one. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, that's a hard name. A name with yeah. no vowels and you have to figure out where the syllables go. And, yeah. you know, I'm like, but Kalata is not a hard name. And so I shouldn't have to use shorten it. Um, and so I really encourage people, like, it starts there. Like, when people can come to work and you're not trying to shorten or butcher their name. And oftentimes when I get co- colleagues from other countries and I know that's what they did, I sometimes will say, like, what's your, like, can I call you? Some of them prefer whatever American name they've given themselves. But yeah. sometimes right. it's literally they've just given up because they've yeah. had so much struggle yeah. with people just not trying to pronounce their name then so i'm usually like what is your actual name i'd like to at least try you know you know uh yeah that's that's so interesting one so much so that we actually recently rolled out um you know in our in our profiles the ability to pronounce your name in the profile so that people can hear what it actually is um because we do believe that it's a like the most basic thing right of mm-hmm. someone's name um but it's, it's pretty impactful if you're not doing it right <laughs> if you're not saying it right you're at least making the effort you know i'm always confirming like is that correct because um you know i'm sensitive to my name being you know misled so i i empathize and can understand the importance of someone being like oh my gosh thank you for asking if that's the right way to pronounce my name (laughs) you know and giving me the opportunity to correct I mean we're so afraid to make mistakes you know and like there's so much fear behind a lot of this work Um, and so a lot of it is getting comfortable with being very uncomfortable and being wrong a lot Um, and we're just human you know Mm -hmm. we're just here to grow and make progress but i i would rather make a mistake than just not try at all you know and and make an attempt and apologize if i need to but um that is people just want to be right and be comfortable and everything's great and that's just not how we change you know so um yeah comfortable getting uncomfortable not easy (laughs) (laughs) yes definitely getting uncomfortable because there's so much also with like this generation especially there's like so much and even like identities and like genders and all these things and people often just are why well, I don't want to it's too hard and yeah. it's not that hard right you know like we've not. learned like the English language we, we say words from like all the cultures we speak a little French a little Spanish a yeah. little Japanese like I'm like so if you could learn all these random like slang words and nuances you can pay attention or just ask Ask. Yeah. And if you're asking and honestly saying, hey, I just want to understand or can you just tell me like what you prefer? Yeah. But it's very much this resistance to, oh, it's too hard and too much and I'm going to be uncomfortable. But like you said, we have to be comfortable being uncomfortable yeah. um, unless you're going to create some homogenous community that lives out in the middle of nowhere we're yeah. always going to be interacting with people that are different from us and that have different <laughs> backgrounds perspectives genders and and, and uh, you know sexual preferences and all these other things like they're yeah. always going to be out there and so we just have to be yeah. comfortable being like uncomfortable and being okay with not always getting it because that's also a thing like we're really yeah. like I, I don't understand it is it for you to understand it Right. <laughs> like, yeah. And like it's okay. You don't you don't have to, but respecting it goes a very long way. Exactly. Right? Respecting yeah, it. Exactly. It's like I don't understand. Yeah. You don't just understand it all. Um I'm yeah. okay with not understanding all of it. I it's not part of my experience. Like I'm not meant to, but I can learn and I can know and understand how to respect it, how to be an ally. Um, and really understand people's different needs. And it, it's just, 
by no means do I want to understate like it's not easy, right? Like this work is not easy. Um, I wish it were because, you know, a lot of times this work gets politicized and mm-hmm. it really is just about being a decent human being. And that does require sometimes challenging our beliefs. Um, and it's tough, you know, it's tough to to really be that open it's not an easy task um but it's worth it if i know my co-workers are coming to work you know feeling safer and and being able to bring their best self yeah like, i'll do the work you know i'll do the work right. and i'll help others do the work too um as yeah. long as willing because we yeah. can't force it either it's a yeah you one. definitely can't force it and i think back to what you said earlier it's about we all can relate to situations where we didn't feel like we belonged right and so for me i'm like i don't want anyone to have to rel- relive right. or feel like how i felt in that moment and so yeah. for me that's really what i think about when it comes to like it's not always easy we don't always get it but i don't want that person to feel like i felt when i was excluded that one day on the playground when i was you know like we all have that one moment or story whether it's in our family or at school or church whatever and so it's just for me i just want to create an environment where at least if that person feels that way i don't want to be the cause of it like i want to be at least the person that tried to make them feel welcome in the situation so yeah and like you said it is hard and we all have our own bias and i think that's the thing also when we talk about allies and yep. you can be an ally with great intentions and you probably still also have biases that you need to work Absolutely. through with. yeah I and i think some people don't <laughs> don't recognize that yeah They're like, oh no i'm i'm a pro okay i i hear you no. <laughs> I mean, you might be a pro at calling it out, but it's so ingrained in us that it's still going to happen no matter how often you, you know, are aware of it because it's all based on our life experience. Mm -hmm. And it just is what it is, right? But I think the point there is like making yourself, creating that awareness for yourself to catch it and be like, okay, that's not that was maybe what I experienced and what I was taught but that's just not how it has to be and that's not the reality right so um yeah it's just so normal but again we fear it we fear so much calling ourselves out and being like yeah that's totally me being biased sorry right <laughs> you know let's, exactly let's not do that. like sometimes I say things and I'm like oh wow like and it's and it's rooted in because you think about it, especially like I'm I'm a millennial but some of the like even commercials and some of the things we we said very yeah. openly on tv shows and other things like that's what we grew up with and then to sure. come to this you know and say like oh i can't i can't i shouldn't say that or you know yeah. or the fact that they had to tell us not to like do you remember the hillary duff commercials where they were like don't say gay and it was basically oh. like don't call things that you don't like gay and like they had to come right. and tell us that <laughs> like they're gonna get hillary duff to tell us yeah and so yeah. it's like you know some of us grew up with that and some people didn't stop saying it like they were like whatever hillary and some of us were like okay but occasionally it may slip or you might think something a little like not okay and it's okay to be like you know what let me challenge this and recognize yeah. that you have them um because i think sometimes with allies sometimes their sometimes their allyship is so almost self like centered on them yeah that it's almost harmful to the people they're trying to ally to yeah um it's a tough subject because and i think allyship could be like a whole episode right because (laughs) yes i need different ways to be an ally but um there's so much to learn there because again there's a difference between intent and um intent and impact right? right and really understanding that difference and how it make ensuring that the way you show up is how it's being like your intention is getting delivered and received in the way that Mm -hmm. you want it to right and again because we don't know the right formula we don't know you know what works for everyone it's just a really a matter of understanding like asking those questions like what how can i be the best ally the best way mm-hmm. to be an ally is to educate yourself and to insert yourself in communities that don't look like you um mm-hmm. and most people won't do that um mm-hmm. it's really really challenging and um 
my whole life I naturally had a huge diverse group of friends so I was exposed to a lot of different communities thankfully um, growing up so I I kind of like dabbled everywhere and okay. I was I, I didn't belong to just one group of people at school I was the one who was friends with everybody um, and somehow nobody still at the same time like I didn't necessarily pertain to like one group but I love that because I was able to carry that experience and have a different understanding more so that just everyone's different every culture is mm-hmm. different everyone has different needs and um and that's okay, you know, and and it's just we make things overly complicated sometimes. Yeah. I think um, we do. But we're not. We're just not used to this work. It's not normalized quite yet. No, it's yeah. not. And I'm really. I know, like most of us, we're concerned, like how political it's gotten, and then if yeah. we have an administration change, like you know, some of the the things that were passed, and even you know, getting rid of affirmative action and just so many changes. It's almost like, you know, we're definitely kind of regressing as a country. Like we moved yeah. really far forward and we're like, you know what? Now we want to slide back really far. This is too mm-hmm. much diversity. This is too much, you know, belonging and all this other stuff. And so I really hope that we can somehow figure it out and really recognize that it's better if people just feel like they belong and they want to contribute um, because the opposite is people start, you know, massively leaving these like certain cities and countries and occupations and even organizations because there's talent in every culture, sex, race, whatever. Like there's tons of people, but you want them to be welcomed and to give you that talent. But if they all start leaving, you're only left with the people that are either willing to endure or the people with the least amount of like, they're like, oh, this is, you know, I'm just here. It's fine yeah. for me. Yeah. And you don't want that. You want diversity yeah. in your talent pool. I really, truly feel that if organizations don't get on board with belonging, um, I mean, it's just that one factor that, I mean, people will uproot their lives to belong somewhere, you know? Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't underestimate that power of like what it could actually do and how it can actually transform your organization and the way people feel working at your company. Um, and how much it changes the output as well. So, um, yeah, I just feel like if you're not in it, you're, you're you'll fall behind, and you'll just have continuous turnover, mm-hmm. um, and at least not have you know the highest quality of product. I mean, diverse teams really produce the highest quality work. I mean, it's going through so many different perspectives and lenses mm-hmm. and experiences and cultures that. Whether it's a service, a product, um, if you have a diverse team and diverse t- uh, voices at the table, really ensuring that like things are you know legit and relatable to everyone. I mean, that's what really I think makes things sets you apart and differentiates you know an organization to one that just doesn't do it or doesn't care. Yeah, and organizations that invest in its people for years, any any person that invests in the stock market will tell you that's where you want to invest your money. Yeah. It's the organizations yeah. that invest in their yeah. people. One of yeah. the questions I wanted to ask is, this comes up a lot, I think, in the hybrid remote environment. Yeah. Um, I think companies are like, well, how do we create belonging when we're not able to see each other and we can't talk at the water cooler? I think it's possible. Right. But from your perspective, like what are some strategies or what has been your experience with still feeling or creating that sense of belonging with people being all over uh, geographically? Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. And it's probably like the greatest challenge we've all had since being remote and, and since the pandemic. Um, and I think we're still trying to figure it out, honestly, mm-hmm. because we've also now gotten used to being on our own too, okay. right? And really valuing that work-life balance and really understanding that you as a person um, have a priority in your mental health and your well-being. So that has definitely increased um but also i think you know as exhausting as a day of you know zoom or team meetings can be like that's what we rely on um that and slack which is just like our internal Mm -hmm. chat system um we have 
um, employee resource groups, our ERGs, we call them CRGs, our community resource groups. Um, and they host a lot of activities and a lot of events and they're hybrid. So there's an in-person factor and there's a virtual element to it as well. Um, you know, technology will always be a factor and get in the waste at some point. It's inevitable. You can't just mm -hmm. eliminate FOMO, right? Like that's just right. not going to go away. But, um, you know, we still find ways to connect through a chat, um, through, you know, GIFs, through memes <laughs> um, and through events and, you know, talks. Um Lots of team building things happen virtually. I mean, it's it's definitely possible, but it does take a little bit of creativity and a little bit maybe extra money sometimes because mm -hmm. um, of the tech investment that might have to, you know, be considered. But um, it's the greatest challenge because people are wanting to connect and be part of a community but at the same time really enjoying and valuing their time home and their time apart and being willing and able to kind of um separate yourself from work so much right like work is not our whole life anymore um at least where i work <laughs> thankfully um, there is a lot of balance and it really is about um, making sure your well-being and mental health comes first, right? So mental health days are a thing. Um, unlimited time off is a thing here where I work and it really does value the individual so that you can get excited to connect when it's time. Um I have the privilege of flying in four times a year to my to headquarters, so we definitely do take advantage of that. And when we're all together, it's very stocked and planned out on on how to team build and connect. Because um, no matter what, nothing will ever replace in person connection. Like it, there, it, there's no way to fully replace it, but. It, um, thankfully, we do have some technology that enables us and allows us to stay somewhat connected. Maybe not all the way, but it is a connection. It's just not what it was previously. So you can't replace in person, but you do your best with, you know, events and um, communications like Slack and stuff like that. But it is hard for sure. Yeah, it definitely is. And I, and I think encouraging people who are a little more introverted or not used to making, you know, they always say get adopted by an extrovert because they'll come find you and be like, hey, are you new here? But like yeah. making that effort because you're going to have to make the effort to reach out to people to say, hey, I'm such and such. And I just started here and I saw you in this meeting. Um, yeah. Now more than ever, like before you could just run into people in the office and you see someone and you're in the elevator or whatever else. But it's like you have to be very intentional and almost make time for it. Like it's part of your work day to say, hey, uh, you know, Anna, yeah. I heard you were on a podcast. But I want to talk to you about like be very much like re like proactive about it. And I feel like a lot of people aren't used to that because they're yeah. like, oh, in the office, because those are the people who want to go back to the office. They're like, well, in the office, I could just pop in. And it's like, well, we're not in the office. And so you can also I still know. pop in. You can yeah. just pop into my team. Yeah. <laughs> say, and hey, Art, call me and I'll pick up the phone, you know, and we can see each other. But I think it's just sort of that hesitancy. Also, I think to one of the points you made earlier, of like we want to get things right all the time and no one wants to be vulnerable and like message someone and maybe they don't respond or you call them and maybe they don't answer. But my yeah. whole thing is like, did you die? No. <laughs> like, the world still went on and you can try again or message them and say, hey, I called you. Yeah. looks like you're busy. Can we chat later? Whatever it is. You know, I said, you know, most people are happy for a nice break to chat and yeah. get to meet someone new in the work day because yeah. most of our work days are full of emails yeah, and, absolutely. and meetings. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. We have this thing called coffee break. So if you um, like subscribe to it, then every month you get randomly um, matched with somebody across the organization to, to meet them. Oh, and, nice. you know, it's a 30 minute chat, but you're meeting people from across the globe and across the organization teams people from teams you'd never probably encounter so um that's that's been a really cool program and then of course there's mentorship which you know um that could be a whole other episode too but um, <laughs> yeah. 
it really does. We do have it to where we set it up and it's working and meeting people that you would never really come across and work with. So um, those have been some other ideas that have really been beneficial for us too. That's a great idea. If you're listening and you work in HR, steal it. I'm going to steal it. <laughs> oh, no, like, it's, we start this thing called a coffee chat. I'm going to bring that in. Like, yeah. it was a great idea that I... Yeah. Just, it just wasn't my it. idea. I didn't think <laughs> it worked. It worked. It worked. Yeah. It sounds great because I think even with mentorship, like you said, we can have a whole other, another episode and even buddies to help people with inclusivity. Yeah, it requires a lot of people's time. And it asking does. an employee who's already putting in a good 40 hours a week and they're trying to balance work and life to say give up this many hours to be someone's buddy and have all these additional responsibilities it's like I want to answer a few questions here and there but I don't want to be anybody's buddy Um, I think it's often hard when I worked in consulting they incentivized it because they would give you free food and and alcohol (laughs) and whatever else so then everyone was happy to be someone's buddy but you know in a lot of organizations there is no incentive to be a buddy other than the fact that you're willing to do it and so sometimes people like they want to but when they're trying to look at their balance and their well-being like i can't really i don't have the i don't have five hours a week to give to this person or several persons but having a 30 minute chat everybody can make that work yeah yeah absolutely i mean and many times it's been like oh i have this deadline or i have that and i was like no this is i'm getting paid to do this right to connect with somebody and what's 25 minutes what's 30 minutes that um i can learn something new about someone connect Mm -hmm. with someone make a new friend um maybe not like a great friend right off the bat but it's like you just never know you just never know so it does require a bit of putting yourself out there and being willing to kind of hope that you know your coffee chats with someone that you have never met are not just you know full of silence and crickets <laughs> but it's like you know. a work meeting where you're just talking about work yeah. and like complaining yeah. and really connecting and I always tell people it's like when you meet them it's like talk about anything but work where'd you go to school what's your yeah. favorite vacation spots do you have kids are you a pet mom like just focus right. on that because work will always be there you can always talk about work but really get to know people yeah. as people yeah yeah absolutely yeah I have some really great work friends that it started just like that like they were in a meeting and I was like oh, yeah. hey I'm gonna call you because I, I want to get to know who you are because I saw your name or title yeah. and you know and some of those turned into really great friendships where we're like you know can, we confide in each other they we provide each other with technical help and resources you know we mm-hmm. go hang out every once in a while but yeah I think people often miss work and part of belonging we actually talked about this in an episode on relationships is this idea that work is just work and i'm not there to make friends and i'm not there to whatever and i'm like you're at work way too often to have that viewpoint sure. like, i understand yeah. you may not be a trust firster like you know i'm a trust first yeah. person and so you have to build but you really should take advantage of the place you are more than anywhere else which is work oh. One of our um, core values is enjoy and be great at your job. And it's just one of those things that it's like, if you don't like where you are and you spend the majority of your life, it's a problem. You know, it's, it's definitely worth seeking out to find a place that you truly enjoy and feel respected and feel appreciated and acknowledged for what you what you put out. Um it's just too much time. We have one life. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, enjoy exactly. what you do. It's too much time. Um, I don't even know the math, but it's it's a crazy amount of, like, years of our lives yeah. that are spent yeah. in offices with these people. Yeah. And it might be different people if you move around a lot, but our view of a place that's had high turnover, unfortunately, but it's still there. And so really exactly. having the friendships and the people you can laugh with, like, you know, yeah. I was out of the country and I came back and there were several colleagues who were couldn't wait to like, can we chat? I want to see pictures and yeah. you know, like yeah. talk about the trip. And so if I didn't have that and I just came back this week and it was just the thousands of emails I came back to, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's it's a lot, you know, I, I, want, I need the social connection, you know. Yeah, you need that balance. You definitely need that balance in order to be a well-being in my opinion you know and and be a healthy well-being 
Um, it's a need of bars. So I, I do yes. believe in that. I think Maslow's mm-hmm. hierarchies, right? So um, yeah. <laughs> I think belonging is, is somewhere in there. I need to pull out my psych books again. Um, I do <laughs> want a question. Um, what advice would you give someone who maybe like you were a few years ago who are is not in the space, they yeah. want to be in the space, like how would you tell them, encourage them to take that first step? Yeah, I mean, if it is already initiative in the organization, um, my approach with, with everything, um, I've changed careers three times in the organization I'm at. So it's always started with uh, volunteering and shadowing. Um, and just making myself available to learn because that's really what I was I mean I don't have a degree in this right and most of the things I've actually done I don't have a certification or a degree in Um, so I rely on experience to teach me um, and to learn you know the trade so um, I would say reach out to the people that are you know in charge of that and ask if they need help with anything or if they can mentor you um i'm a huge believer in mentor i think i have three of my own so um i think that's like a huge a huge way to really get the experience that you're trying to gain um and relationships i mean they are everything you know Mm -hmm. your connections and your networking um might be some of the most invaluable things skills uh that if you can acquire to like build relationships wherever you are um I, I, it just it goes such a long way so I hate to say that it's who you know sometimes but it's it's the right people and also letting yourself be known of um, this is what I'm looking to do these are the skills I'm looking to learn and develop in um, and knowing the right person that can help me you know develop them so um, shadowing and volunteering was kind of my first step so I would definitely say that's that's a great first step if it doesn't already exist in your company i would email hr or talk to someone in hr and be like i'm interested in starting a group you know i think Mm -hmm. the ergs are just a first great first step of saying um you know we have a few people at work that are from the same community and we'd like to get together regularly and educate and celebrate and have talks or you know bring community and build community together so um if it just doesn't exist i feel like starting your own group if that's allowed um is a great way to kind of just get started to understand like oh we have the same issues here or we you know see the same challenges challenges or um and just finding community i think is so important so so important um and not being the only which we call the syndrome of the only in the room or in the organization um if you don't have the ability to do any of that honestly the best thing you could do is work on yourself (laughs) um it's really tough if your organization is just like absolutely not never will um, I think we don't know how to fight that fight because right. <laughs> I'm in an organization where, you know, I have a lot of support and I, I get told yes a lot, thankfully. Um, but it does require data sometimes and really understanding like X amount of the organization feels this way or has this need and it would benefit you know how do you bring it back to the business and build a business case that this is actually a good initiative and a good fit for the organization mm-hmm. you're at yeah i think you, and you said something key the business case because sometimes the leaders are stuck on the political story about what they decided yeah. the eia is but there are there is a lots of lots of data and articles that support oh, yeah how adding diversity and inclusion initiatives to your workplace even adding making more of a learning culture how that turns into better results in terms of customer service retention and you know turnover costs money so you know if you have to like spend time you know putting together something but it's out there so it's not like you have to go out and really become a data specialist or or get a phd there's forbes has articles harvard review 
Um, heck, on LinkedIn, like people randomly yeah. are posting data and stats and good stories. Um, there's Google Scholar where you can find like scholarly articles for free. Um, and you can put all of that together, ATD, any big HR org like SHRM or yeah. one of the psychology institutes, they also have it. Um, so also mm -hmm. really like people, like, like you said, you might have to do a business case if nothing exists, but yeah. don't shy away from it. But you also said something that I often have to reiterate to people I'm trying to mentor or um, coach is the volunteering. So many people want to do something different, but they don't want to do anything different. So yeah. they want to do the exact job they have now and then be magically placed in this new job that they prefer, but they haven't demonstrated one that there's someone that's going to be able to handle this new ambiguous job with very little guidance or that you're like the kind of person who's going to like raise your hand to get things done if you're just sitting yeah. there. So really the reach, raising your hand and volunteering, which yeah. may mean you may have to work a little more than your normal job because you're doing this other thing, but ultimately that's going to help you get work or get it, you know, yeah. worth it. I mean, there's been a few times um, as happy as, you know, I could be in my job. I mean, there's just a moment where, you know, it's time for whatever's next. Right. <laughs> and um, at that point, it would be like, OK, I get to do what I want, which is volunteer in order to do what I have to do. Right. And create that balance um, in the interim of changing careers, basically. So um, I, I do feel that it's worthy of following what you're passionate about just because again like this is so much part of our life so such a big part of our life and to not fully enjoy it and yeah I think that was my way of owning my career was always being like hey I want to learn what you know <laughs> right. can I help you um how can I help you know and how do I make the time for that and obviously getting my own manager support which is number one I never did anything behind any of my managers backs or anything like that but again I'm in a place where I feel safe where I know that they much rather you change departments and roles than lose you um and they've because they value who you are so they don't they don't want you to go they but they want you to be happy right yeah. they want you to do something that you feel challenges you enough and and you know makes you want to stay longer so internal mobility um is a big deal where i am like we we definitely um support it greatly so me reaching out to another manager saying hey could you you know help me mentor me or can i shadow you like it's not abnormal by any means they're like yeah come on board some departments actually have that program to where you can intern with them or something for a little bit of time to see what they do how they work if it is an interest for you to transfer into that department so um we've normalized internal mobility 100 percent, which is Maybe not 100%, but <laughs> there's, all, there's a lot of areas where like, no, your work is so specific. Yeah. But, yeah. 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 But no, yeah. I think that's great. And I think to managers listening, I think that part, like I never understood when an employee would come to their manager and say, hey, I just want to go do this thing for three to six months or however long, and then I'll come back. But I really want to know this and I think this will be valuable. And then they say no, and the employee is quitting. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. which did you prefer? <laughs> I'm like, like, did you right. want to lose the employee for three to six months or now have to fill? Because filling a job, especially in the federal government, it takes three to six months. So the I amount can... of time this person could have been gone and come back, you now yes. have no one. And you're out hosting the job, doing the interviews and all of that instead of supporting. So I've always been, you know, the manager, like, how can I support you? Um, and encourage managers and if you sometimes it's not even your immediate manager it might be the upper management and yeah. so if you're like two or three levels up think about the larger organization and the long-term health of it versus being selfish for the six months right now because that six months right now might also get an employee who will stay with you another two to three years because you gave Ooh. them that opportunity they wanted so yeah, I think that's important and so I'm glad you're in an environment where they 
are supporting your like desires and listening to your ideas. Um, and yeah. I know, unfortunately, some of the listeners are not, but it's like, yeah. Well, yeah. what can you do? Like, like she said, work on yourself or think about an exit strategy or do it on your own time with orgs that you care about or right. organizations. And then you can possibly still transition into a career. It just may not be where you currently are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, I think people traditionally get hired to do one thing. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that is such a disservice to okay. not just the organization, but humans, right? Like we are, we have the ability to learn and to do multiple things mm -hmm. and to continue growing and evolving. And I think it's a need of ours to do that. So I think it would be really silly honestly for someone to be like well this is what you're going to be doing the rest of the time that you're here and if you don't like it you gotta go um that's very more traditional more what <laughs> maybe would be accepted back in the day and i think that's mm -hmm. changing now thank you yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and currently um, where I am, it's I think we're still, we're opening to that, but generally across a lot of, especially in the government and a lot of more traditional places, it's very much like this is what you're hired in, this is what you qualify for, and there's very little opportunity to move, especially as you move up. Um, so I often tell people, if you're early in your career, that's when you need to do all the hand raising you want to do. Don't wait until you've been promoted and you're now like you're a senior executive in a career and then you realize you hate it because your only option at that point is honestly to quit or start over or just ride it out till retirement. And it's unfortunate yeah. the number of people I meet that are literally they're like, I'm just riding it out to retirement because yeah. they feel they yeah. didn't. They didn't look for other paths earlier. Um, yeah. And sometimes I know there's competing interests. Like we are starting families. We're trying to do other things. Sure. But really like to take ownership of your career. Like that's something I'm so glad you said it a couple of times. Is I really think people need to do that. Like for me, I've been in HR forever, but never in one kind of HR. Because mm -hmm. anytime I was interested, I would go, hey, I want to do that. Can I go to a class right. on that? Yeah. They talked about it in the summit. Can I start a work group? Can I join this work group? And so yeah. I was able to create my career in HR instead of just, had I just sat back and let them tell me, I would be an HR data analyst. I would still be making yeah. PowerPoint charts. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I, they'd be great PowerPoint charts. But that's yeah. literally what I was doing. And I went to my boss and said, you know, I'm bored. Like, I, I want to do yeah. something else. Um, I'll still do the data as long as you all need me to do it, but let me do that other work. Yeah. And so we were able to go from no human capital office to creating one around yeah. the work and stuff that I did. And I think so many people don't realize that that is possible, not possible everywhere, because there are some right. cultures that aren't quite there yet. But it it is you have to find out, like, but don't sit back and assume, raise your hand and then let them confirm either that you're right, it's not available, or be surprised that it is yeah. an option for you as well. Yeah, I think we would be very surprised at how much we can actually carve our own path in certain places. Um, and we don't even know what's possible, right? Um, but yeah, it takes a certain level of bravery and, and just kind of like, again, just owning that, you know, and knowing that like, this is the path I want to take and it might not be here. You know, this might not be the place, um, right. but at least let me figure it out and try and make sure that this isn't the place. Um, but the worst to have is like a bored employee. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like someone who's not motivated or challenged or growing. Um, not good. Not good. Not good. Yeah. At all. So not good it, at it's, all. Worth, it's worth um, managers leaning in and then realizing and noticing and, and trying to help them find the right place to be um even if it's not on their team right mm -hmm. so um but i don't yeah i think we're still working on that yes so we're definitely still working on that <laughs> yeah. it's territorial and well i hired you and right. you know really getting around our own ego to say like i want you to be yeah. happy i sometimes would tell employees that um and sometimes some of them would take it well some of them wouldn't but i would have very candid conversations to say i don't know if this is the job for you and it's not even that they were necessarily like bad at the job it was just something where i was like i don't feel like you're really invested 
and I and I also or I feel like you're struggling I think you'd be better at or what do you think you'd be better in because I'd like to get you there I want you to be somewhere where you're making good money you also like the work and then the work's not like killing you like it's not so <laughs> hard to the point where you're like literally you can't sleep at night and so I think having that honest conversation because some of us ended up in careers right you ended up there you went to a job fair or you needed a job badly but you know like you control your destiny and you don't have to wait it out until retirement and why would you spend the next you know like most of us can't retire to in our 60s why would you spend the next 20 30 plus years like in a job you're like right i hate i don't want to be here yeah yeah that's it's um not a great way to live and work no. you know and it impacts so, your belonging if you hate your job there's nothing your organization can do for you to help you feel but like you belong no so you're the problem no. you're just not invested right. so they can yeah. spend all the money have yeah. all the town halls have all the teaming events but if that's a core you can hate your job there's yeah. nothing they can really do to bring you around to really feel like you belong or be happy with where you work. And granted, yeah. work is still work. So you're not going to be happy 100% of the time, but sure. it shouldn't be where you're waking up like dreading it. And, yeah, and literally no, you still have to take responsibility for yourself, mm-hmm. you know, and, and be giving it your best. And if you don't, if you're not in the, in the space to do that, then that's on you to say, you know, I need to make a change. Um, mm-hmm. Cause yeah, we can't expect everyone to just like, here's a promotion. Congratulations. <laughs> you know, like I wish it were that way, you know, yeah. um, I've had to ask for promotions over and over again. And um, I've had to read books and learn how to do that and negotiate salaries. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't just come naturally to us. Um, no. to people, you know, unless you were given that and fulfilled that um, in your life, which if you did, I mean, so envious of that. But I really had to work at learning how to, you know, no matter what the offer was, always ask for more and negotiate really? and be like, OK, you're saying no right now, but I can ask you in six months and maybe the answer is <laughs> different. Um, yeah. You got to know what you want. That has to be clear you know so. yeah mm-hmm. you have to be clear and advocating for yourself yeah yeah and i mean belonging and i think it kind of it's like bring it home it's like a lot of belonging but also thinking about mental health and wellness ah. um also like diversity so there's so many things involved and so if you are a practitioner or an hr person and you're on the call you're like you're listening you're like i don't really know what to do and we like we both said as, as anna said multiple times it's not easy we're not by any means be like anybody can immediately stand it up tomorrow and you'll figure it all out no there's a lot of factors and the culture keeps shifting. There's also things happening all the time that's causing people to have new conversations yeah. and honestly creating conflict. I mean, there's things happening right now and we see some of the social media reactions and people being labeled things just because they don't agree with what's happening. So I think just yeah. really know that it's going to be a journey. Yeah. <laughs> and and yeah. the seed planted today may not bloom for five years, but you'll get some, you'll get some little buds. You'll get some yeah. leaves. It'll you know, do you know. It'll <laughs> exactly. Do for sure. The roots will grow, um, but yeah, it's yeah. really something to grow. What are you passionate about outside of belonging in your work? Like what, what, what do you think about? What are you passionate about? Um, You know, this, this might sound different than maybe a lot of the answers but um I'm kind of passionate about myself I'm a very like big self-help person and That's um, awesome. I've been learning a ton about myself and and really like healing traumas and working on my inner child and and so I kind of tend to like geek out and nerd out on just human psychology um, nice. And really understanding human behavior and why we do what we do and what happened when you were X age that makes you do this today, right? So, um, I'm... Sounds yeah. like I hear the next prayer for you. I have soon put out the honor of a psychiatrist. <laughs> or like I mean, wellness coach. Like I like I feel like I'm hearing another career out of your passion. Maybe, maybe. But I will say 
you know, it all leads to something because this career in itself has led me to that, to really like go down that introspective journey. Um, and, you know, I never a dull moment learning about yourself. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about healing and progress. No, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And so what is uh, a book that changed your life? Um, so because I am a self-help nerd, um, I'm obsessed with Brene Brown. So I have done like some of her workshops and I've, you know, read the majority of her books. But right now, Atlas of the Heart is the one that's really making a really big impact on me. Um if I had to pick one in my whole life, I remember being, you know, early 20s, maybe, and really reading the Celestine Prophecy. Um, so that was one from back in the day that really like stood out to me and really helped me start getting curious about spirituality and, and kind of taking me down a different path. But um, anything Brene Brown, honestly, I'm such a fan and she's changed my life more than she'll probably ever know. So, <laughs> yeah. Let's see, how has failure or an apparent failure set you up for later later success? And with that, do you have a favorite failure? <laughs> I don't know if I have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, honestly, I think it has to do definitely with relationships, um, you know, and just continuously failing at them um, and really understanding that a lot of that failure um, came from myself, right? And not really being aware of that. So, and right now actually at work, um, we try to celebrate our failures and call nice. them out on a weekly basis because it's the only way to grow and get better at anything, but we just are so fearful of it. Um, but the most important, important failure for me was definitely um, relationships, you know, and really understanding what my needs are and how to change who, not change, but heal and work on pieces of myself and parts of myself that needed to grow and, and evolve in order for me to find the love of my life you know um and so i know that sounds cheesy um and i've <laughs> never been more okay with cheesy i'm so okay with cheesy these days um but I, I don't think if i hadn't failed at all of those other relationships um that i invested so much in um would i be where i am today and so happy in love and you know found an amazing partner so um just such a big part of our lives but I feel like failure in communication and relationships is uh yeah it's probably my biggest one and uh especially because before the partner I have right now I was single for 15 years so I really did um work really hard at looking at the failed relationships and understanding what were the areas of myself that I needed to work on and develop before I could really attract a relationship that could have the potential to succeed so yeah without it i don't think i would have found my partner right now that's awesome <laughs> yeah. and i love how you immediately talked about the reflection piece because i think when people have a failure or just it's basically a failure it's like you something happened you either didn't achieve the desired results you wanted or you didn't do something yeah. you were supposed to do right so people are like they just get stopped by it but it's like really what happened <laughs> Yeah. What did you expect? Yeah. What could have been what could be done differently? And like you said, it's not really about changing yourself or recognizing how you could do things differently or what you are. Sometimes it's even what we weren't saying. Because I'm sometimes so relationships the it's because we didn't set boundaries, right? Or right. we didn't like or we got upset and then kept it to ourselves and stewed for <laughs> you know, until we exploded. Yeah. Um, so yeah. a lot of times it is like, how can I pay it? Or are we ignored flags so it's not always like okay it's also just us overlooking things but yeah. it still comes back to yes maybe that person did something right because you walked on what they did but also where were you in it because you can't change yeah. that and if you have a repeated pattern of failure you got to be able to be like well i'm the common denominator here right. i need to figure something out 
exactly. Um, yeah. yeah, and it's interesting because now, kind of bringing it full circle, I chose this relationship because of the way I belong in it. Oh, nice. Um, and so belonging for me is something I'm very passionate about, not just at work, but in my life and in my circles and in my family. Um, and so I take it with me everywhere. <laughs> and it's just like what I'm known for now in my circles. Um, so I'm okay with that. <laughs> so Anna, where can people find you if they want to reach out to you um, on social media or LinkedIn? Yeah. Where can we find you? Yeah, I mean, I'm really just on Instagram. It's nothing crazy. It's clearly underscore Anna, A-N-A. Um, my profile's public. Happy to be a friend. Um, always love making friends. And um, yeah, you can find me on the gram. <laughs> nice. Yes, we'll yeah. definitely find have you on the gram and I'll share links below. Wherever you're listening, you'll be able to find links so that you can reach out to Anna. I um, also want to thank everyone for listening and remember to like, subscribe, comment below. Um, also, uh, please make sure that you are also checking out my Instagram as well. It's your work auntie. I'm your work auntie everywhere. Thank you all again for listening. And Anna, thank you so much. It has thank been a pleasure of mine to have you today. It's thank been a you. Pleasure. Thank you.